Hello. I'm going to be talking. I'm going to make two videos and I'll I'll release them a day or so apart, I suppose, about two tragedies that are happening right now, going on right now. And uh, that, it's difficult to know which one to start with first, but I suppose I'll start with Afghanistan. Uh, before I do, I uh, want to uh, thank all of you who responded to my request that you uh, click the like button because it, it obviously seems to have worked. My videos do seem to be getting a bit more uh, airing than they used to. So I, I do appeal to you to carry on, especially as because this video is dealing with Muslims and the other video I'm going to make will be dealing with a domestic terrorist event. I won't be monetizing any of those. I haven't been monetizing any of my videos now for, uh, well, you know, the last four or five videos, have I? So, uh, yeah, all I've got from you now is the like button. So please use it liberally. Uh, but um, th that's the cheeriest I'm going to get, I'm afraid. And if you don't feel like being really depressed out of all the hell by a video, then you better not watch this because it's not um, it's not a blast, really. Uh, so let's talk about the tragedy that's going on in Afghanistan, the dreadful things that are happening to Afghani girls um, the awful thing that's, that's happening to Afghani society generally. And I don't blame America for pulling out of this. I actually don't blame Biden for pulling out of it. The Americans spilt a lot of blood trying to make that the, the Afghani regime stable enough to withstand this sort of assault. But it just proved not to be possible. It's something, if you Americans ever studied your history, it's something that neither the Russians nor the British succeeded in doing. And the British, at the very height of their powers, when they could do more or less what they liked because there weren't any intrusive press people in there uh, talking about the, the misery of uh, villages being burnt out or whatever, whatever the British did, they couldn't do it. And they couldn't do it mostly for geographical reasons, but there's also the, the religious aspect, and it's that that I'm talking about now. Excuse me. Breakfast. Okay, so what is happening in Afghanistan, no two ways about it, is directly attribut attributable to Islam. There is absolutely no doubt about that. It is Islam that's caused all of this and will continue to cause all of this. And I don't know what the answer is. I'm just putting the facts before you as I see them. First of all, uh, the, the problem has been that Pakistan has been giving shelter to all those people who are now coming back to take over the country. And that's why neither the Russians nor uh, the Americans uh, even with a backup from 43 other countries, including my own, it was not possible to defeat them because what happened was they just melted back into the hinterland of Pakistan, where religious fundamentalism, which still abounds there, sustained them, both spiritually, educationally, if you can call that an education, and physically, with arms and, uh, and uh, supplies and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, that came from the Americans because, and the British. They hand out aid to Pakistan by the bucket load. And Pakistan immediately, uh, you, well, they might have used some of it. I believe they, uh, there's a British, uh, I may be wrong about this, but I did hear about a girls' school in Pakistan that the British paid for that still doesn't have any female students in it 10 years later. That, that's what goes on in that society. And, uh, of course, the money ended up being used to support the, what they call, insurgents who had come over from Afghanistan or who were Pakistanis who were uh, thinking of, you know, making their own empire in Afghanistan, if you see 
what I mean. Um, so Pakistan is a good deal of the problem. And unfortunately, we've been contributing to that. We, the British, the Americans, they're just not joined up thinking. They see poor people in Pakistan and they think, oh, we've got to help them. And they don't realise that that money never gets to the poor people. It goes to the fighters, uh, the fighters for Islam. So there's that. But there's also the very nature of expansionism, which is embodied in Islam as a culture. You see, a Muslim man can marry up to four wives. And more than that, technically, he can have as many female slaves as he wants. So in practice, that's not the general rule, because even with a slightly higher male infant mortality, boys still outnumber girls by about 1%. And so if only 2% of the adult male population have, have just, well, two wives, you've got a shortage of females. And that shortage gets worse when you consider how many of these wives die in childbirth, because let's face it, medical care isn't that good in most Muslim societies either. The very richest ones, of course, they have access to the very best in medical care, and most of that is imported from outside the Arab world. It's not just a matter uh, of poverty. You see, well, a colleague of my husband a few years ago, he uh, ran, or maybe he still does, run a, a college in Israel. And one day he was accosted by one of his Arab students uh, after the exam results had come out, and the student found that he'd failed. And this kid was really angry. He, he wasn't angry that he'd failed. He was angry uh, and, and this is what this colleague told my husband. He was angry because he couldn't understand why he'd been failed, seeing as he paid all his fees for the course. Now, that's the, the, that was a cultural assumption he was making. You pay the teacher, he's going to pass you. And that is widespread in most Muslim societies. Now, multiply that small example by a whole society and, uh, you know, the attitude that if you pay your, t t your tutor, you absolutely have to get a pass on the exam. And of course, conversely, if you don't pay your tutor or perhaps you're too poor to pay, you don't get the pass. Well, that doesn't help the best people get the best jobs, does it? However, I digress. Let's get back to the little girls dying in childbirth in Pakistan and, and now in Afghanistan as well, because they have no access to medical attention. And in any case, they've been screwed too young. Uh, so you end up with a shortage of females of any age. So what do you do? Well, one way is a disregard for male life. So you get a lack of safety in the workplace, for instance, the tolerance of poor sanitation, uh, poor medical care and sloppy safety practices, the encouragement of dangerous and life threatening behavior, well, like war, for instance, with promises, of course, of an afterlife of endless debauchery in paradise or executions or maimings for comparatively trivial offences, that does tend to whittle the men down a bit. And then, as I said, there's war. That's the best way to get rid of some surplus male population. You send the men off to fight another tribe or the next country, and the result is usually that the returning survivors will gain females from the vanquished population, and they might not even return as well. They'll just set up house there. And so they'll leave a higher relative female population for the men who stayed at home. Uh, so that's Afghanistan. And that's what's driving what's going on in Afghanistan, whatever they say about the glory of Islam. It's control of females that these men are fighting for. Uh, well, now let's talk about what's happening here in the West. Well, one of the things that used to happen in Muslim societies where there happened to be no war at the time was the practice of raiding the next generation. It was very common for teenage girls to be married off to men of 40 years old or so. 
And this was really common throughout the Middle East until, I suppose, the 20th century when under colonial influence, Arab societies started passing laws limiting the lower age of marriage. It didn't work that well because the families simply lied. They'd take their 13-year-old daughter, say she was 17, slap some makeup on her, put a veil over her face, give her a pair of high heels, and then she'd be married off. But modern documentation is actually slowing all of this down. It's putting a stop to a lot of it. So apart from the most remote villages, this option, it's definitely still a thing, but it is becoming more difficult. So the other release valve of Muslim societies for their frustrated young men used to be foreign slaves, you know, either bought, kidnapped or, or the result of armed assault. Uh, you know, that's what's going on in Nigeria right now. Any polygamous society must either reduce the population of males or increase the supply of females from somewhere else. And of course, both actions require a certain level of violence. But as I said, modern documentation and the increased difficulty of raiding southern Europe for slaves is really putting pressure on traditional Muslim societies. And this is the driver behind Afghanistan and the invasion of many mostly young male refugees from Muslim societies pouring into European cities. And it is the driver behind the slaving gangs we have here in the UK, what the media likes to call grooming gangs, because, well, nobody likes to admit that British girls have been made into slaves in the same way as they've been made into slaves in Afghanistan now. Do they? Why not treat yourself or a favoured relative or friend to these magnificent examples of merch? The mugs and t-shirts come in the Granny Opteryx design or Grambo with a firearm or the more deadly knitting needles. Go to www.grannyopteryx.com and whatever platform you're watching this on, please click like, subscribe and share, share, share.